my distinguished guests, fellowship of the curious, I've brought you here today to behold my latest creation. It's another robot. Okay, let's get to it. To fill you in, there's these things called camera sliders, and I want one, but it's stupidly expensive. Leave me alone! To the point, I, I see the price tag and I have this little voice running off in my head. It's like, yo, yo what if you, you built that, that instead? Is that what my voice sounds like? Is that what my inner monologue sounds like? Uh, anyways, most engineers and artists and makers come up to this, this dilemma where we know that we can make something, but should we make it? And then I look at the price tag again, I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm gonna at least design it and then decide later after I understand a little bit more. Let's just take a moment to recognize how sick nasty it is that we get to make stuff at all because how many species on this planet, I, I mean, only get one blueprint? Beavers have dams, birds get together and make nests, piglets come in groups of three and build progressively stronger houses, but we get to build every flavor of robot. Welcome to the channel. And the first thing that I like to do when I'm designing something is make sure that I understand all of the requirements of a system. What exactly does this need to do? What does it not need to do? And maybe that second one is the more important question because that's less work. So let's walk through it. What does a camera slider do? Camera sliders are used in videography to like create smooth motions that, that move in a straight line. So we're gonna start the requirements list. Pretty simple. The robot must move the camera in a straight line. And at this point, if we stopped there, you might be looking at me like, Alex, brother, we have camera slider at home. Grab the thing and walk with your feet. Well, first of all, do you know how many coffee cups I have on my desk? These weren't even props for the video. I'm just actually overwhelmingly hyper-caffeinated. My hands vibrate at A440. Separate from that, well, what if no one else is home and I want to film stuff with movement? in the shots. What are we going to do? We're going to build a robot to do it. We want a camera slider, okay? But this brings up a good point for our second requirement. A camera slider is for smooth motion. So the robot not only needs to move the camera in a straight line, it needs to move it smoothly. And I think that's like the main broad strokes here. I kind of want this thing like right now. So we're going to be using only the parts we have around the house. Now, fortunately, I, I happen to have a YouTube channel about building robots. And so that's not as limiting as a criteria as you might think it it would be. All the camera stuff is going to be based around this tripod mount that I'll hold up to the camera later. And in my scrap bin, I found this linear rail and rollers for the rail. So that's gonna be exactly what we use to get smooth motion, I think. And any gaps that we have, I'm fully expecting the Bamboo Labs A1 printer with the combo filament changer. We're gonna be set mechanically. We have a final aesthetic requirement because this is on a YouTube channel and it needs to look cool. It needs to look sleek. So we have our requirements requirements written out all nicely and I go through each one. One, the robot needs to go in a straight line. Two, it needs to use parts I have around the house. Three, it needs to fit on my camera. And four, it needs to look cool and sleek. And while I'm brainstorming, I'm always asking myself, what is the simplest solution that meets these requirements? If you still have like a gut dissonance, like, oh man, I don't know, this seems too simple, like something's wrong, this doesn't feel like it's gonna fit. It's actually an indicator that you have an undefined requirement. I mean, th there's a requirement of the system that you haven't explicitly put into words. And that is often where you're going to fail. At least that's what I found. So we have a simple system idea here. We're going to take this rail. We're going to attach it to the tripod on the bottom. We're going to attach it to the camera on the top. And then we're going to have a string across it that pulls the cart left and right. Bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> I'm a genius. And I was reveling. Is reveling the right word? Hey, Google, what does reveling mean? Uh, so I was reveling in my genius design when I ran across this one. This one, their motor comes off. That's really cool. Oh, and then it dawned on me. There was something that I had completely blanked on. When you drive a motor with power, we all know what it does. It starts spinning around, right? So you give it electricity, it spins around. If you physically spin it, then it's going to generate electricity. It goes both ways. In robotics, that's called back driving. And sometimes you want that and sometimes you don't. In our case, it could be bad for the electronics, but worse than that, it's just going to make it kind of like crunchy and not move as smoothly as if the motor wasn't there. So I actually realized this is just another requirement. I'm gonna tack that onto our requirements list right there. 
The next thing that I like to do is not common advice anymore. I think that you need to get out a big piece of paper or pieces of paper and you need to write out every single thing that you can. Exact measurements of things that you have, numbers you need to remember, calculations you need to do. I mean, at least to me, drawing stuff out, no matter how rough it is, always helps me in the long run, actually designing it later for 3D printing. Now there's a point after you, you finish drawing stuff out and, and you run out of space on your paper, you have numbers all over the place, your sheet's covered in coffee like stains. Uh, <laughs> there's a point when you're like, man, if only there was a computer that could aid me to design this. And you pull out the CAD modeling. What CAD is really good at is displaying, you know, relative distances and constraints and, and making sure that everything's squared away. And so here's this design that I have in CAD. We have a, a top rail and a bottom rail, and we have a cart on top. And I, I'm not worried about everything else yet. I'm just trying to fathom, like, is this concept possible? We're gonna have the two carts slide in the same axis so when you pull on the string this way it's gonna pull the cart and then the rail is also going to move so we kind of get more motion for a smaller footprint that's the concept of this design and most importantly we're gonna be able to drive this system with a motor on the side just like that one that I, I, I saw I'm just stealing design concepts from them because it seems like a good idea yippee Anyways, to bring us back to the topic at hand, we have a design, we have the mechanism pieced together, we have a guesstimate on the time it's gonna take to build it. It's time to start asking the question, like, should I build this? This is your branching point. For us, in this situation, it still makes sense to go forward and build this thing because, uh, one, we have all the, the metal parts already and then everything else is the Bamboo Labs 3D printer, so it, that thing's solid. And two, the risk is really mitigated because we're making a YouTube video about it. So there's no reason for me to turn around now. I'm just gonna keep going. We now start to enter the world of prototyping. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how you lose subscribers. <laughs> like These two pieces uh, have idlers and they use the T-slot nuts. They use the T-slot nuts. Okay, so now these things slide in like that. And the trick here is to realize that your design will change. Then the next thing that you need to ask yourselves is what changes are the most impactful to this design? For example, if you decide to build, what's something to build? A sandwich. Your design includes two slices of rustic sourdough, a nice slathering of premium crunchy peanut butter, and a scoop of grape jam. That's a solid plan. That's a commendable design. So you go for it, you get out that bread, you scoop the jam, you spread it on the bread, you grab the peanut butter jar, and and peanut butter machine broke. The only other sandwich materials we have in the kitchen are roast beef. We can't pivot to a roast beef sandwich. There's jam on the bread. Oh, but what if we make jam toast? Well, we can't pivot to jam toast because we thought we were making a PB&J and we didn't toast the bread first. So now we just got floppy jelly bread. Despicable. I mean, that's deleted. There is no way we could have possibly foreseen this. There was no way. Except, of course, by looking in the peanut butter jar. I mean, like... What is the analogy here? The ana I'm, what I'm trying to say. This is why it's critical to look at this phase of the design as a series of tests. And you should organize those tests by one, how critical the information is that you're learning, followed by two, how easily can you do those tests. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I bet it actually tastes pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. I actually cheated on this project by building a similar robot like a, over a year ago. And so a lot of the tests that we would normally have to do were already done by me, thanks. Because of that project, I knew that the 
biggest hurdle was was going to be checking like how well the rollers were going to fit on the rail. So the first thing that I did was print some test pieces to see if this rail was going to cut it. And it's at, it's at the core of my design. So luckily with the Bamboo Labs printers, I just dragged and dropped the files from my CAD straight into the slicer. And I just press like one button and then I walk over there and the, the parts are sitting on the 3D printer. The quality of the, of the prints are pretty good, but actually what's crazier is the speed at which you can design stuff when you have a 3D printer just sitting in your house. I get in these rhythms basically where I'm just sending a part over and then the thing starts printing by itself and I start designing the next test. And by the time that that thing is done, I still am not done with this. So there's no downtime. It's just test after test after test. And before you know it, the design's done. And if there is any downtime of 3D printing, I just scroll around on the Bamboo Handy app and then print more fun stuff because there's like a whole lot of community design files that you can just send over from your phone while wow, we live in the future. Anyways, as I keep prototyping and testing, eventually the core functionality of the robot like made sense. I was like, this is gonna work, that's exciting. But then the problem becomes, well, how, how do we make it look good? A lot of DIY builds functionally work, but you can't convince anyone that it was worth the time to make it because it just looks so bad. And it's just, it's embarrassing, isn't it? No worse insult than someone seeing your DIY build and then looking at you and being like, yeah, this guy's an engineer. But I do have some tips and tricks. It was introduced to me as the elements and the principles of design. To keep it super short and sweet, the elements are line, shape, space, color, texture, and essentially like how we use those are the principles. Unfortunately, that was a two sentence simplification on an entire professional field of study. But I have some good news. We, we, we don't have to, we, we don't have to do all that because in most cases, we're not designing something that's going to exist by itself. It's going to interface with something. I already have this camera gear that by definition has to be included in the design. And because it exists already, it has design principles. So we don't have to know the right answers. We can just be dirty little thieves and take them instead. And, and by cheating off of the people who are like literally paid to do that, your stuff's gonna look a lot better. Let's sum it up. I'm gonna sum it up. I'm gonna sum it up into some advice that you guys can can take away from this video. If you follow these rules, your your designs are going to look so good that people will then doubt your engineering capability, okay? They're going to be like, what kind of art school contraption is this? Step one, identify pieces of your build that you can't change. For me, it was the camera gear. It might be these metal parts. Notice them. Step two, step two, from those pieces, identify its elements. What colors, what textures, what silhouettes and forms are present and ask yourself if any of those repeat. If they repeat, copy those and put them more in your design. If you can't identify any element that repeats, well, there's about to be some elements that repeat because you, what you're going to do is you're going to choose one of them and you're just going to copy and paste it all over your design. So if, if there's a one chamfered edge, well, now your piece is going to have more chamfered parallel edges. If there is one piece that's carbon fiber, well, now your pieces are going to have those carbon fiber looks. Plus carbon fiber on a YouTube thumbnail is a plus 22% strength buff to your YouTube algorithm. Anyways, check this thing out in action. For the rest of this video, I think we're just going to be playing around and seeing what kind of shots we can get with it. Just, just hanging out. At the end of this project, the bill of materials of this camera slider came out to about $40, I think. And if you add the Motor Go Axis, which is my own design, so it's kind of a weird pricing. And then the motors that we slapped on there, it's probably like $80 to $100. And it took a solid week and a half to design it and build it. I will be slowly making upgrades to this thing, so it's going to get a lot better from here. It's going to live on as a project in my Discord. We have a whole Discord community. Um, and it's also going to live on GitHub here, like, cause I really love open source hardware. So you can just see every single thing it takes to make this. The great part, since the motor is removable, you could build this thing, you know, the cheap and easy part, and then put your own motorized solution on there with stuff that you have laying around. So, you know, more people that build open source stuff, the more happy I am. Oh, and one last thing. Thank you to the patrons. Do you see all these names flying around here? This is because these people gave real hard earned money to help us with this channel's mission. Like because of them, we're able to make educational content. And, and because of them, we're able to, to spend energy and time on building open source hardware. And it's, it's a dream come true. So thank you to all of these people. And if you would like to become one of these people, there's a Patreon link in our description. It, it really means a lot to me. It really does. Remember to like and subscribe. Leave a comment in the comments section. That's all for now. It's not in focus. <laughs> no, I turned off. Ha <laughs> ha